All right, all right, all right. You all ready to uh, rock this? Yeah. Yeah? Cool. All right. We're going to do this, and I'm going to try to record this because if it's in decent enough quality, I'm going to post it on the mic. Because people come up to me all the time and say, I wish I had seen that, or insert person here had seen that. So I post a lot of these online and stuff. So you can go back and revisit because it's going to be that awesome. All right? So, one thing to be thinking of during this whole thing right now is why the stars? I, I pick all my images and pictures and some of that for a reason. Why the stars? I'm going to ask you that question later on in the end. There's something there. All right? So, good resource here. This website, we are also designing another one that's going to go with this, but we are all one big team. And you call any one of us, you call me about child care, I don't know anything about child care other than put on Thomas the Train Engine and go. But I work down the hallway for people that do child and youth services, they can work with that. So I'm one of them. In other words, if you call one of us, we'll figure out who to help you with. All right? And also, there's those sheets of paper that have the fast regions. Click that on your refrigerator. Seriously, that is like hardcore awesomeness right there. All right? So, those of you who may or may not know me, I am Sergeant Black, I'm from the Billings Program, also known as the Jedi Council. And I meet people all the time, and they're like, what do you do? And I'm like, the Jedi Council, he's on the scene, and they say, what the heck is that? How do you do that? Give me the, the, the words about how to be an awesome person. You know, what's the seven step process? You know, all the, the secret ingredients. And I tell them it's actually very, very, very simple. They lay it on me slick. I said, okay, well, first thing is exercise. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> exercise. Mount the evidence for exercise, right? That's one of them. Second thing, eat healthy food. McDonald's doesn't count. Whole foods, macronutrients, micronutrients. Seriously, that is so important. It's not even funny how important that is. Third thing, sleep. We don't get enough sleep, right? Seriously, make that a priority. Set an alarm to go off at a particular time of night to begin your ritual of going to sleep. And after a while of doing that, you will start to fall asleep easier at a certain time because your body is expecting it. But you cannot recuperate, you cannot rebuild muscle tissue, you cannot flush out toxins in the brain unless you are sleeping. Next thing, meditate. That's why I lost half of you. Like, what? Hippie stuff? No, it's not. We'll get to that in a second. But seriously, this is a hugely important thing. Next part. Work towards something meaningful. You don't, you, you're not born, you wake up, walk outside the street, and then somebody goes, here's the meaning of life. You gotta work to find it. You create it. The responsibility is on you to find your meaning in life, not me or anybody else. And then lastly, do good things with good people. Go find quality people and spend time with them. Make relationships. That is huge. Guess what you are? Some of you are not. I know you know who you are. But most of you are mammals. And mammals crave emotional connection. One of the worst things that we can do to somebody is separate them from the unit. Go drill someplace else. Get outside my room. You're in solitary confinement. It's one of the worst things you can do to somebody. So, a common theme to all of this is that the body is stupid. This right here is really stupid. You can trick the body. You can really trick the body by the way you think or by, by the way you behave will influence the way you think or what you're eating will influence the way you're thinking or your behavior will influence how you're feeling. Feeling sluggish, go walk around the block. The point here is that if you influence any one of these three, you will influence the other two. Some of our influences are negative. Some of our influences are positive. So, I'll show you a video coming up next. If you've seen this video, please keep quiet. Don't say anything. Remain absolutely still and let everyone else who has not seen this video have fun. Okay? Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball.
correct answer, 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half miss the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for... Alright, so in psychology what we call that is attentional blindness. And guess what? We are primed. Our brains are geared. We're looking for the negative. Can't help it. 500 billion trillion years of evolution, right? We are like, where's the snake? Where's the saber tooth tiger? Be on the lookout for that. If you miss that saber tooth tiger and you're dead, guess what? <laughs> Your genes don't get passed on to the next generation. But if you forget about where the apple pie is, not a big deal, right? So we are geared to spot the negative. We're constantly looking for the negative, right? And the problem with the negative is that maybe you got something good, like ice cream. Mmm, ice cream, that's good stuff. And then until there's one little thing that happens, and this ice cream, bowl of ice cream is ruined. The whole thing, right? For some of us, no. But the general thing, when you start looking, I mean, take out the ice cream, look at other stuff. What you typically see is that a jar of ice cream is ruined by one rat turd, but one rat turd is not made better by a jar of ice cream. True story. Try it. Go try it. Go try it right there to see. Report back. Okay, I don't know how it right? But the point is that we sometimes, with our thinking traps, we're looking for that negative thing. We're constantly looking for it, and we're not even aware of it. And that changes how we see the world around us. So one of the things that we teach in our resiliency skills is a Kenny, I need mean, 50 pounds of roast beef. Sign that. We're all out. No, oh, don't give me that. Would your wife wolf it down for breakfast? <laughs> That came out wrong. Look, she's 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 not. She's look at me. I mean, we're probably we probably wait a. Second. All right. So this example of ATC. So with the ATC that we teach our MRTs, resiliency trainers in your units, we teach a skill about being aware of what our ATC is. So A is activating event, T is thought, C is consequences. So the way it works is the activating event in that example you just saw was silence after telling an edgy joke. That's all we know, the who, what, when, and where. Not the why, just the, just the facts, right? So there's silence. And the first thought that popped in one scenario, the first thought that popped in his mind was he offended him. And if that is a thought that pops into your mind, you're not even aware of it. That's not your inside voice, that's a down lower voice. Right? And that thought pops in, the automatic emotion that is linked to it is a, mo it is a thought emotion linkage. The thing that pops up from this is guilt. That's normal, right? But what if he had a thought that he dropped his phone laughing? The automatic emotion that pops into his brain right then, maybe he'd make him feel happy. He'd feel pleased with himself. Like, yeah, I feel a good joke. Yay. Or maybe his first thought was the cell, uh, uh, cell signal is bad. That's like a tongue twister. So his first thought may be, or his feeling may be frustration. He may be feeling a, a lot of frustration was could compel him in his behavior to switch to Verizon. I'm an at t user and I'm all the time frustrated. So, there it was. I've got like nine marathons under my belt or so. I don't drink a lot of milk and eat dairy and some of that. But occasionally, after a 50 mile run, I would give myself the luxury of chocolate milk. So last July, I just done a 50 mile run. It was hot chocolate milk, and I drive to the AM, PM, whatever it is, and there's chocolate milk, right? And so you have 50,000 thoughts a day, constantly. Your, your mind is constantly throwing out thoughts. It's a squirrel cage of thoughts, right? Actually, a couple of them. And so my squirrel cage is going, chocolate milk, chocolate milk, man, it's going to be so good. I can't wait to drink the chocolate milk. It's going to be just chocolatey and cold and creamy. And, oh, it's going to be so awesome. And there's the chocolate milk, and I reach for it, and I grab it, and it doesn't come out. I'm like, what? Hey. And my brain is like, so why not waiting? Hurry up, get chocolate milk. Hurry up, do chocolate milk, chocolate milk, chocolate milk, chocolate milk, right? I grab it, I pull it, I'm like, seriously. And then it pops out. And my hand goes up. It's the uh, the great 
bam, cut myself, gone and leave. Brain is like, don't care, talk to me, don't talk to me, don't talk to me. So I take my finger, and I got the blood, you don't care, I don't want to bleed all over my texture, right? So I blood, I go there, brain's going, hey, put the time hurry up, hey, work, hurry up, turn me on, turn me on, turn me on. So I take work, and for luck. We bought the top, right? Get in the car, <laughs> going home, <laughs> destroy the chocolate milk. There is no savoring, there is no it's a nice bouquet of chocolate No, it's <laughs> right? So I drink that chocolate milk. Now that the chocolate milk is gone, I got like half a mile to go to get home. Half a mile, not far at all. Now my brain has to, you know, it switches from chocolate milk to other thoughts. So it's like, you know. Uh, when's the walking dead coming back on TV? Hey, squirrel, you know, what's that radio that's on coming on? And eventually those thoughts goes, dude, you're bleeding. Why are you bleeding? Our thoughts are habitual in a lot of things that we think. A lot of habits. So I started looking for a reason. I'm, I'm an NCO. One of the NCO's primary jobs is to do on-the-spot corrections. So I'm like, my brain is like, you're bleeding. Why do you bleed? Well, because some jack wagon stopped the chocolate milk to, whatchamacallit, he stopped it wrong, caused me to pull my hand out and wait so he doesn't know how to stop milk. Jack wagon. I am compelled to go tell this guy how to stop milk. In fact, I start getting angry because this guy doesn't, he's probably laughing. You know, at, he probably watched me in the mirror, he's probably laughing at me. I'm gonna go punch this guy in the face. What I realized, and I'm, a quarter mile from home now, is that my anger level had gone up. I was actually seriously considering turning around and go set that guy straight, right? Bringing out the old knife hand. <laughs> you will, right? So I realized that. And then have you ever been angry with yourself? Or, or, or angry at a bar and one of your friends comes up to you, you know you got the, 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 the angels on your shoulder, so you got you know, the, the devil and the angel, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> Have you ever listened, when you were angry, to the angel? No, you haven't. Not even if it's you. It could be the smartest person you know comes up to you and says, here's some counter evidence. You're like, I don't care. Get out of my face. I'm about to go teach this fool, right? Even if it's your own voice. You don't want to hear it. You just want some righteous justice. So, one of the things that we teach with our resiliency skills is mental game. Mental games, the function of a mental game is to take you out of your mental mode now and put you someplace else. Fire. If you've got a fire that's going on and there's gas that's feeding into it, what's one way of getting rid of that fire? Take out the fuel. The thing that is fueling my fire are the thoughts. Stop it. Right? So, one of the things that we do in mental games is we do something that requires focus, it's got to take our full attention, it's got to be short because I ain't got all day. I'm about ready to turn around and go beat this guy up. So I don't have 10 hours to spend on this. This is going to be now. And it's also going to be fun. Because if it's not fun, I'm not going to do it. All right? Who wants to do calculus? Two of you know who you are. There's a lieutenant coming in the back. She can help you with some counseling. <laughs> all right, that joke worked. Woo! We're working on that all week. So here is a mental game that we do. This is one of my favorite ones, all right? So alphabets, in every group of two letters, name a famous actor. For example, A, B, maybe, and then finish. Right? Or CD may be Cameron Diaz. Ia is a car, Errol Flynn. Right? And here's this one IJ. Whoops, I'm off. GH, Gregory Hines. But IJ. So now I got less than 100 meters. I'm driving through my apartment complex. I got less than 100 meters to park my car. And I'm still thinking about turning around. But right now, I'm getting to IJ. And I've done this presentation, this part right here, dozens of times. And I've always asked the question, and I want to ask it to you right now. Give me an actor that starts with the initials IJ. Come on. Who? What? I can't. Is this military group? I mean, I know a military group talking about voice of command and such, right? OK, there's one. We were up. But that is a character, not an actor. I always get Indiana Jones. But it's not an actor, it's a character. So I am struggling right now. I'm not even breathing. If you were watching yourself just now, some of you did stop breathing, you let that. While you were thinking. And in less than 50 meters, as I'm pulling to my spot, I'm going, I, uh, in, 
India, Indigo, Montoya, the rest I am. Uh, I'm just racking my brain for an actor that starts with IJ, and I can't. And as I pull it into my spot, and I park the car, I go back to the voices, the angels on my shoulder. Why would that guy stop and go that way? Because he's the only guy at work, and he's over work right now. He doesn't have time to keep going back there to stock and milk. He wasn't the guy to stock and milk, the milk delivery guy did. The guy at the time before stock and milk. A million other reasons I came up with, all of which were good enough for me not to beat this guy up because I was no longer angry. Make sense? So, another tool that we teach, it's called Hunt the Good Stuff. This is huge. This looks simple. Do not be deceived by how simple this looks. All right, it's like that guy from Sling Blade. He's pretty simple. He's got a sling. Nobody? Seriously? Alright, that joke is dead. So, hunt the good stuff. This thing is incredibly powerful. This is as effective as happy pills. Go to the VA, go to the counselor, get a prescription for it, insert antidepressant drug here. This is as effective. Yes! Former president of the American Psychological Association, Martin Seligman, makes that claim. Not me. So, why don't you bring it in, right? What is this magical thing of which we speak? Well, I will tell you. You name three things, you write it down. That was good. For example, I had a good coffee this morning. Not that Wolf Game Pub stuff in the, in the hotel room. I brought my own coffee. I ground that stuff. Yeah. I'm thankful for that coffee. Right? That's it. Name three things that you're thankful for and what you did to get it, or contribute to it, or why it was good. Just something, a little blurb about that thing. That's it, that's it. And if you do that for 20 days, 22 days, it will change your brain. You will now start looking for the invisible gorillas. Because we call it hunt the good stuff, because it is not our normal go-to state to look for the awesome stuff. It is our normal go-to state to look for the snake. And so when you train yourself that when you first do this, you're just going to be hard. First time I did it, it took me five minutes to come up with three names. And now I can rattle off 20 of them without even blinking an eye. When you do this, it rewires the way you see the world. This does not take away the saber-toothed tigers and snakes and dangers. You are still well aware of the dangers around you. But you're also aware, well aware of all the great stuff around you too. It opens up a universe of awesomeness. Which life do you want to live in? Depressed life or awesome life? Filled with bacon on never-ending platters with coffee as far as the eye can see. Right? It's out there. Live your dream. So, what if you are living your day and something big, lousy event happens? Alright? Big, lousy event. Something traumatic. For example, like iPhone batteries did. No Wi-Fi. Alright? <laughs> I mean, sometimes this is a traumatic event, man. I ain't lying. This is a big deal, you know? Sometimes not. All right? Anyway, something negative happens. And, you know, you just start freaking out. I mean, like, was that SpongeBob? Yes, that was SpongeBob. All right? What about that? Or, what about if you're in the weeds? Anybody former uh, restaurant workers in here? All right? You know what in the weeds means, right? That is like, in the weeds is when things become stressful. It's not one event by itself, it's the fact that this person here is asking you to get tea refilled every 30 seconds, right? And this person here's food is not cooked correctly. And this person over here is whatever, you know, all these different stresses add up. And as all these stresses add up, you get tunnel vision. When you get tunnel vision, you start to focus on one little thing, one that you don't see the bigger world around you. So either of these two things, how can we counteract that? What can we do? Well, here's a tool right here. Those of you that are some medics in the room, right? I was talking to some of y'all last night. You crazy people. <laughs> medics are crazy. They ain't no lie. Here's one thing you can do. Oh, that's loud. So exhale your breath on this part. You're still exhaling. A constant exhale. Now this is an inhale. Constant inhale. Now a constant exhale. This is the beginning level on this app, Kamiyama, free. I do the super hard advanced level, that's crazy hard. But this right here will activate the vagus nerve. Go Google it. Vagus nerve. So basically, y'all have heard of the fight or flight response? 
the fight or flight response is one part, and then there's the um, uh, friend and befriend, or what is it? I don't know, it's got some super crazy idea. And basically, it's the opposite of the fight or flight, the chill and relax and make friends with people response, right? You can't have both those responses at the same time. And remember, the body is stupid. So if you do behavior or thoughts, you will influence the body. If you influence the body, you will influence behaviors and thoughts. So right now, if you're like getting weeded out right, and, and stressed out and such, you do this behavior, this will influence the body. As the body calms down because you are not doing the fight or flight response, it will calm your mind down. I've had bartenders that work for me that just get in the weeds, and you've seen those bartenders, they're like, ah! And I'll pull to the side, and I'll say, look at me, count to 20, deep, deep breath. And they're like, I gotta go back to We were never so busy ever that unless you're like in the middle of the firefight. And even then, I've seen the soldiers do it. Take 20 deep breaths. One guy in the firefight, Iraq, is he could not, his machine gun went down. He could not bring that sucker back up. He was frustrated. He got tunnel vision. There was some stress, right? A lot of stress. What does he do? Takes out his cigarettes, leans back in the gunner turret. No cigarette. And after he did that for a little bit, he's like, oh, there it is. Back into the fight. That was way more productive for him to do that than it was to hit the panic button, just keep hitting the panic button, just hope something changes. Hope is not a strategy. So another tool. Another tool is what we call the three by three. I'm a big fan of this one. This one's very easy to do. You can do it right now pretty easy. Try this next time you are in traffic and you are angry. You know the time. Try it, all right? Because you have tunnel vision. The only thing you see on the traffic is that jack wagon right up there who's driving the left-hand lane at the ungodly slow speed of 70 miles an hour. Go! <laughs> ah, right? That's the only thing you see. Dude, we just passed Disneyland. Don't care. Guys, driving 70. Get on the left-hand lane. Right? You know where you are. So the three by three tool is named three things that you can touch. So right now, you can name those three things. You feel your butt in the chair. Maybe you did, but now you do. You feel the shirt on you, the clothes. Maybe you've got some keys in your pocket, you feel the weight of those keys. All right? You are brought in your perspective out of the tunnel vision. Also, next thing is three things that you see. I see that chat wagon. Okay, cool. There's one. <laughs> name two more. I see the overhead, you know, well, overhead, ceiling. I see the carpet. Three other things. You are taking your perspective out of the tunnel vision. Another thing, three things that you can hear. I hear the sound of traffic. Okay, there's one. I hear the, my tires on the highway, that sound. I hear the radio. I hear the person in the passenger seat trying to breathe. Don't get the smoker. You need to quit smoking, seriously. Don't. Right? But this 333 is very powerful. Again, you are taking yourself out of that tunnel vision. And this is easy to do right now. Try this next time you're in traffic, a traffic jam, and you are just angry. Try it. You will see how hard it is. I did this with a veteran that was suicidal uh, and was in a police altercation. I called the police for a 911 because I was three counties away. And then a, we had a two hour standoff. And at one point, I used this tool. And it took me five minutes to get that person to get to no, just two touches. Two! Because it's so focused on that one thing. And so I use this one tool that I use. It's a powerful tool. So as you, some of you are going overseas, some of you are staying back here, both of you have a lot of work to do. A lot of different challenges, right? But there's some commonalities amongst all your different challenges. Maybe separate, but there's still the roots of them together. So there's commonalities, one of those things is battle buddies. This is going to be your support, all right? Your battle buddies. And I know it's a term that we use for our soldiers, but the same is true for people that are uh, the family back here. You're very close friends. You know who they are. The people that covered you when you ran from the police. Right? People that bail money. Right? That is a great source of uh, support right there. Other people? So another thing is cohesion. I teach infantry school. And one of the things I do, I'll get 30 soldiers in who don't know each other from all walks of life, and I've got to build cohesion. One of my favorite ways to do this is smoke the crap out of them. <laughs> Log drills. That builds great cohesion. You know, give you a common enemy, <laughs> groups come together over a common enemy, man. It's awesome. 
But same is true for uh, people back home. And you don't need a common enemy, but go bowling, go do some stuff together. Build that cohesion. As you build that cohesion, that will fight against your sense of isolation that you're the only one going through it. Because I promise you, you're not the only one that is experiencing what you're experiencing. Another thing, leadership. You got a lot of leadership that has a lot of care about what's happening for the families and the soldiers. Some of them don't, you know who you are. Yeah. But for the most part, you got some great leadership. You really do. I mean, I've been a part of a lot of meetings over the ARC and the MILDEF and such with leadership going, what can we do for insert person family here? Let's make it happen. Use your leadership. All right, it goes for the FIRSTs and the FASTs and the FRGs. That's part of the leadership chain for you. Another thing is training. All right, so while we're training on our battle drills and such, that would help you with your sense of uh, optimism. The more you train, the more optimism. So NCOs that are doing training, especially on free bowl, one of the things that I hate to see NCOs doing is like, let's go goof off. No, that's when we need to train. I love training. All kinds of weird ways, right? But as you do that training, you develop optimism. Because in the back of your brain, it's like, I can handle whatever challenges come my way because I've trained for it. Well, here's something you can do as a family. Before you go over, do a fire drill. Who's done a fire drill before in the house? Where the kids know where to go. I used to hate Barney the Dinosaur. And I used to be in a volunteer fire department in, in Houston. Uh, I used to hate Barney the Dinosaur until some kids were saved in the house fire. Because one of the things that people know is not the way the fire sometimes that, that hurts you, it's the, the heat. Talking several hundred degrees difference between here and here. And so you stand up, all of a sudden, man, you got 400 degrees plus heat in your lungs. You're toast. And these kids crawled through the house, checked the hot doors, and got out. And they asked them, How did you know how to do that? And they said, Barney. We live in old Barney. So I am forevermore a Barney fan. I love you, you love me. We're big old happy purple dinosaur family. Right? So training. So figure out what can happen, you know. Flat tire on the side of the road. How many people have trained for that? Some people never have tra uh, done a flat tire. Break it out. PMCS, right? So that will build your sense of optimism. And if I'm deployed overseas, and my, my girlfriend's back home, I feel a whole lot better because I know that she's trained for this, 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 and this, and this. I'm not so worried about her. Because guess what? The worry goes both ways across the pond. <laughs> I'm more worried about my family than they are, well, I don't know, debatable. But anyway, sort of training. Professional support. You got a lot of resources in professional support. Returning Veterans Project being one of them. Military One Source. A lot of professional support out there for you. Not only in mental health, but other things as well. And family and friends. Sometimes you just need to go play later, Jack. Or both. All right? So another thing to do to, get, to be awesome is exercise. I am not even kidding you. This is, this is not a suggestion. This is a requirement. Exercise. And people ask me, what should I do? Do what's fun. Right now, whatever level you are, do what is fun. If it's not fun, you're not going to do it. So do it often. Once a week, if that's all you can do, that's a starting point. But you want to get to three, four, five times a week plus. All right? Consistency. All right? So for people going overseas, I love this. All right? What is workout of the day? Hike five miles from 100 pounds, 100 plus pounds of kit, bound 400 meters by section, lay down some press and fire, and assault one Taliban fighting position for time. I'd like to make it an MRAP personally, but it's kind of. But think about it. I mean, you're carrying a lot of stuff, so you got to train for this, right? So, one of the things that, I mean, being an infantry instructor since 2007, and I've done a lot of different training, but basically over the years, all I have trained over and over and over again is marathons. I'm a marathon runner. Okay, like I know. Those are all marathons, those half marathons, those Ipcos. I don't even count 10Ks anyway. That's not even worth my time thinking up for. It, right? But when I did my first marathon, it was hard. <laughs> I mean, I had to start, I had to build up strength for it. I had to start training. And there were days I couldn't even run two miles. I'm not kidding you. Could not run two miles. Because it hurt. It took me a while to build that base level of strength. But after doing this, I didn't start running marathons so I was 39 years old. I'm 44 now. So, when I ran a couple marathons last November, or as it was, last spring, I was picking up one of my marathon kits, and there were some people next door that were talking about spark races. I was like, mm -hmm. spark race? And so I was like looking at stuff, I was like, man, I am not that little, little bit right now. No, I can't, uh, no. 
No, I can't do it. I mean, put 100 pounds on me, I'll buck cycle you to the ground, but that's all I got is bucking and running, that's it. You know, I can't climb up a mountain and do all this weird stuff. So November, I joined the CrossFit gym. And I recently did the Spartan Pack West. We did all these kinds of cool exercises. I did a 10 foot wall like it was nothing. I was like, what? All kinds of stuff. Did that, that was pretty freaking cool. You know, I did the cowbell, you more cowbell. It was awesome, all right? So the point of this is, you're going overseas, what kind of physical fitness training are you doing? You gotta get ready for that stuff. Same thing over here. And the physical fitness that you are doing, one of the best things to do, when you are stressed out, that stress stays in your body. It doesn't just dissipate. It stays in your body. It's in your nerves and your muscle tissue. And over time, your blood pressure goes up, your heart rate goes up, all sorts of things happen. So one of the best ways to counteract the buildup of stress inside your body is running. But the problem with running is that if that's all you do, you become super one-dimensional. So I started doing CrossFit, I couldn't do a pull-up. 25 years ago, the Marine Corps, that I could do a pull-up. And now, I'm, you know, I'm an old guy now, I'm 40, something, 44 years old, I couldn't do a pull-up, right? I couldn't do an overhead squat. I mean, do squats. People, they would laugh at me, I'm like, man, your squats are lousy. But that, I'm a runner. Runners are notorious for having really poor flexibility because all we do is train running, one dimension. And working CrossFit since that has helped me greatly. I mean, I'm not, this is not a paid spokesperson for CrossFit, I'm just saying.
scientists, you sort of got to work out. I mean, one of the, one of the things that I run my soldiers through, I, I call this the soldier one, 15 minutes, all you need. And some of them like, dude, this is my favorite thing, and I do this with my wife. Yeah, you don't need any gear, all right? This is a great start right here. So, get a timer, then you can look at the clock, and then for three minutes on, one minute rest, three minutes on, one minute rest, three minutes on, one minute rest, three minutes on, stop, right? So you got four sessions of three minute workouts, right? And you can do what's called an AMRAP, as many rounds as possible. So, you start off with air squats. So you do 20 air squats, all right? So proper air squat, you do 20 of those, and then you jump into hand release push-ups. So a hand release push-up, I can't see anything, but you do a push-up, chest all the way to the ground, and then lift the fingers off the ground, that's one, and push yourself up, all right? That, because nobody in the army, seriously, nobody does proper push-ups. I've seen you get these. Y'all don't want me judging you. Because <laughs> there's a captain and a warrant officer in Bill Death who will never ask me to do anything again because it's like, two, two, two. <laughs> this doesn't count. No. All the way down, right? So you do 20 push-ups and then you do uh, 20 sit-ups. And so that is when you sit, you, you don't need anything to put your, your feet under. Just sit, throw your hands back, and then sit like this. 20 of those. So we do 20, 20, 20, restart at the beginning and keep going all the way through. And then when it hits that three minutes, rest for 60 seconds. And wherever you left off, start on the next one. Make sense? And so at the end, the four rounds of three minutes, when you do that, you may have like say five, six, seven rounds and you know, 22 reps or something like that. But that's quick, fast, keep your heart rate going up. And before you know it, they'll actually help you with your EPFT because you're working on all the things that you're going to be using during your EPFT. Right, you don't have to spend three hours at the gym. Next thing that people often overlook is sleep. Again, I am not even kidding. This is huge. All right? People say, I'll sleep when I'm, when I'm dead. You know, there's time enough to sleep in the grave or suck it up and drive on. And sometimes you got to push the forward, right? But if you've gone without sleeping for a while, you know how groggy you get. Try it. I, I mean, I practice my own medicine. I monitored my sleep for a week, and I made it a point of getting eight hours sleep a night, and it was amazing. After a week, the night and day difference of what I was able to think and do just from getting regular sleep. One day of awesome sleep is not going to do it. It's got to be regular. You are not what you do some of the time. You are not what you eat some of the time. You are what you do or eat most of the time. So every once in a while, I'll have my screen. But most of the time I mean bacon, and bacon is healthy. True story. Alright? But these three things, it is, paleo diet, go look it up. So these three things are so important that the Army Medical Command is like, we have got to emphasize this on our soldiers. It's called the performance triad. They are making a concerted effort to push the importance of nutrition, sleep, and exercise. Because guess where our soldiers are worst at? You all heard the global assessment test? I get the results every quarter. Guess what we are worst at? Our lowest three areas. Sleep, exercise, and nutrition. When I ask soldiers what they're eating, they're eating Carl's Jr. They're, they're, eating, they're drinking so many Red Bulls that their veins are coming out of their eyeballs. Right? They're smoking, they're dipping all the time. They don't get much sleep. Then they get to drink alcohol, and they eat crappy food. You're killing yourself. Got to be healthy. So, another thing. The goal, the meaning in life. All right. Here's some research. Winter can't help it. All right. If you want to, if you want the article, I can send it to you or so. But guess what? So social exclusion. Y'all know what social exclusion is, right? That's what happens when I tell you guys that I play Dungeons and Dragons. Now I'm no longer invited to your parties. I told you, die. All right. Roll a twenty for charisma. <laughs> so social exclusion. When social exclusion goes up. Meet, perceived meaning in life, so I give this person a questionnaire to rate their meaning in life. Meaning in life goes down. So, what do you think? You don't, you know, you, you can help fight this by making a, a purposeful effort to include other people. I'm all the time making my soldiers do burpees. Why? Because I saw one, another one of my soldiers eating alone. And I told you guys, do not let anybody eat alone. I don't care. This is not a suggestion. This is not you will do this. So, 50 burpees because he ate alone, right? And guess who's now no longer eating alone? This guy. But that does have an effect because whatever reason this is, that has an impact on the meaning of life. It's perceived meaning of life, right? 
Another one, positive mood. Y'all know what positive mood is, right? Positive mood goes up. Guess what happens to me in life? Goes up. But guess what? It's bidirectional. So one of them influences the other one. And so if you're meeting in life, if you really work on that, it will influence your positive mood, vice versa. Guess what influences positive mood? Sleep, nutrition, exercise, endorphins, man, it's awesome. Endorphins, it's not just for breakfast. Those things influence positive mood. And now, because you've been eating healthy, getting a regular sleep, and exercising, you have this crazy feeling that there's more meaning to life. And you didn't change anything about what you believe. Tricky, huh? But this one, coherence. Coherence is a very unique word. So coherence is basically predictability. A lot of people, they talk about how they're creative, they don't like things too structured and such, but that may be some personal preference, but deeper below that, you create predictability. You cannot handle unpredictability. It's how humans are wired. We love predictability. And if predictability, what we call coherence, goes up, meaning of life goes up. For example, one great tricky little study, so the psychologists were very tricky people, they had people, two groups of people rate how they liked some pictures. Before they rated these pictures, they measured their meaning of life, and then they rated you know, these pictures, and rated their these pictures. Group A, they, there were pictures of, of waterfalls, streams, beaches, mountains, you know, natural stuff. Group A, random order, just random pictures. Group B, unbeyond to them, and unadvertised, tricky, it was also in the order of the seasons. Spring, summer, fall, winter, spring, summer, fall, winter. It's not obvious. It doesn't say, bam, this is in order. It just, it just was. We, they picked up on that at a subconscious level, and because they felt that coherence, they then really rated their meaning of life higher. So coherence on deployment, it, a lot of people think that it goes out the window. We got a lot of coherence on deployment. I mean, we had some chaos. But we got a lot of coherence. When to eat child, where to show up to eat child, uniform, the whole kind of yard. There's a predictability, right? When you come back home, that predictability is gone. You know, there is no child schedule. It's when are you hungry? And there's a bunch of stuff. So one of the things that you can do is make a schedule. When to eat, where to go. Every Monday night is Monday night, night meatloaf. Every Tuesday is Tuesday tacos. All right, Wednesday night wings. That's one little thing from coherence. Goal setting. Showing earlier about working out and all this good stuff, this helps you build a sense of mastery. One of these other things that will help this is goal setting because we create meaning. You've got to work and build that meaning yourself. I can't give it to you. So goal setting, I'm, I'm not going to use any of the acronyms. You know, I, I'm anti-acronym. That's AA, A squared. But anyway, when you figure out a goal, what does done look like? Vision statement, right? What does it actually look like? taste like and see and feel like, describe that stuff, right? And then, how do you want to measure it? All right, I want to be a good person. Well, what does a good person look like and how do you measure a good person? I mean, hours I volunteered at the shelter or whatever, whatever the good person is for me. And then, what's the next step? Actually, what is the next concrete item that you can tell your kid to go do this and you figure it out? You gotta break it down Barney style, all right? Do you know what the secret of life is? No, what? This. Your finger? One thing. Just one thing. You stick to that and everything else don't mean shit. That's great, but what's the one thing? That's what you've got to figure out.
endless trains of the faithless, of cities filled with the foolish. What good have made beings or me or life? In 1994, when I, or 95, when I first started college at the Marine Corps, I used to belong to uh, an organization on campus, a uh, leadership organization, and uh, one of our sayings was, be your best self. I had that up in my mirror and, and on our training binder, be your best self. What does that mean? I can't tell you what your best self is. You know what your best self is. When you figure that out, whatever it is, I promise you, is connected to action. Aristotle talks about virtue and how human beings are designed, we are for work. And we, we not work like pushing brooms, unless there's something virtuous in that pushing the broom, which there can be. But you find something to do, to work, to exercise your reason, your rationale, your effort, something that you can be your best self at. That's amazing. It'll get you out of bed in the morning. True story. So, mindfulness. Da, da, da. This is when half of you like hippie, crystals, patchouli oil. No more patchouli oil. Maybe, I don't know. Anyway, mindfulness, right? So suppose you're Batman. I mean, always be Batman, right? Or Bat Dad. I love Bat Dad. So here you are, and we're going to do some mindfulness. This is how this is. If you ask about talking about meditation, I and mean, there's this misconception of meditation by clearing the mind, and you're supposed to enter into it, become tranquil, and nothing going on. And that's baloney. Here's what's going to happen. So when you do this, you'll sit down. Here's one form of meditation. When you sit and you notice something, and you focus on that. For example, your breath. And so it is just like this. I'm breathing. I'm breathing. I'm breathing. Out. And as you're focusing on your breath, a thought pops into your head. Cheeseburger. And you're no longer thinking about breathing. But you're thinking about cheeseburger and bacon and, mm, and barbecue sauce and veggies. After a while, you do it for who knows how long. You suddenly realize, hey, I'm no longer thinking about breathing anymore. I'm thinking about the cheeseburger. So you bring it back to the breathing. I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out. Because the part of the brain that does the thinking, and the part of the brain that does the focusing is different than the part of the brain that's paying attention to what it's focusing and thinking about. It's not the same part. And so this part that is aware of what it's thinking about is pretty weak if you haven't exercised it. So every time you do this and bring it back to the breath, you just did a mental push-up. You trained yourself to stay on task. And so you bring it back to the breath. And you're going breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. And another thought pops into your mind. And you're like, oh, the cups. Yeah. Blah, 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 the pitching staff, you know, Lester's been kind of disappointed, but there he is, man, there he is, strong right now, he's our ace, you know, and then, holy cow, third best record in baseball, right, fourth best record in baseball right now, woo, go Cubbies, 96% chance of making the World Series, uh, uh, playoffs, dude, and before you've been asking why, you're like, I've not been thinking about breathing, so you bring it back to your breathing, you just did a mental push-up and made that part of your brain stronger when you bring it back to your breathing, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out, after a while, your brain again wonders, squirrel, you think about something else. Like, you know what, I can't do it. I found this cool road. I can't wait to take my thing down and just enjoy that road. It's going to be great. Right? <laughs> and after a while, guess what? You realize you haven't been thinking about breathing. So you bring it back to the breath. Breathing in, breathing out. And if you do this every day, this is just like a diet. This is just like exercise. This is just like sleep. You don't get the benefits because you do it every once in a while. You get the benefits because you do it consistently. That's key. Key. You're not going to eat a salad and lose weight. Although, how many people would eat a healthy salad and then go straight to the weight scale? You know, you, you know you've done it, right? So, same thing with meditation. You've got to do it all the time. And then, if you do it all the time, what you realize is that you develop the ability of when thoughts come to mind, you're still focused on your breathing. And these things, you just notice as they come in and go out. 
and let them go. There's no judgment. There's no holding on to it. There's no repressing it. There's no nothing. You're just aware of it because your mind will think it's a weird stuff. I promise you, your mind will think of weirdness, but you won't let it go. And because you're able to do that, you are now in control of yourself. You have more control of yourself now than before because you can direct where to put your attention at next. Squirrel, I think we'll leave it a squirrel. Bacon, yes, bacon, right? I'm directing myself now. I am no longer manipulated by the forces of fate around me. It's huge. So, for 10 seconds, focus on this cannonball. intentionally went over 10 seconds. Because how many people had a thought like, yeah, they want 10 seconds. <laughs> See, your brain, it's, it's called monkey mind. You can't help it. There's no such thing as not having thoughts. Monkey mind is there. Do not feel bad because you have monkey mind. Zen masters have monkey mind. But they're not ruled by the monkey. Right? So, remember earlier at the very beginning I said, what about the stars? If you saw me yesterday, you may, you may have saw that I was at the bar, I was reading a book, I was reading a Roman philosopher, Epictetus, the uh, Interidian, good book. But in that, the very first paragraph of that book is this, and I can't pronounce that. But basically, you may be familiar with the Serenity Prayer. The Serenity Prayer is based off of this ancient Roman book. What you can control and what you cannot control. The wise stoic tries to figure out this. A person that is in control of him or herself figures out this part here, right here. What you can control, what you cannot control. You're not really in control of your body. You think you are. You have influence over it, but that's not the same as control. Because your body gets sick. Or weak, or old. So that is not truly within your control. Right? But you can influence it by the way you think. But the reason I point the stars out, because the stones are very big about the logos universe, we all, God, everything, right? And as you start looking at the universe, how feeble of it is it for you right now, with all your emotional want, to make that star right there move? You don't. You can't. Because you know it's going to do what it's going to do. You don't have control over that. Same mentality when it comes to other things that happen to you in your life. Realize that there are many forces out there that are working on it, and the only thing that you can control is your own self. We can control our emotions, our judgment, creativity, our attitude, our decision, determination, desires, perspective. That you have control over. And if you have influence on that, you can react to something with better purpose. All right, so to sum up, these are six things become awesome. This will build a sense of strength. Resiliency is not a quality, like the color yellow. It's not something that you come into somebody and say, bam. Resilient. It is a complex interaction of many different things all working together. That's resilience. There's no one thing that's going to make you resilient. It's all this stuff, plus more. Work out, meditate, eat healthy, find some meaning, work towards a goal, do good things with good people, and get plenty of sleep. This will build you a, a basic sense of strength and health. And from that stronger position, you will rebound, bounce back from anything that is thrown your way. So here's my phone number, here's my email. I'm gonna post this video on this website here later on. I don't know, you can watch that all day. Alright, good stuff. Alright, so thank you very much.